Well, listen, do you have your Bible with you? You lying. Half of you guys are lying. Okay. And for those, who, those of you who have your Bibles, or if you don't, why don't you rise to your feet? Why don't you rise to your feet? We're going to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. And we're going to read verses 3 through 6. If you don't have your Bibles, no worry. It's going to be on the screen for you. Amen. Father, we're about to read your word. Consecrate our minds and our hearts according to your perfect will. May we understand what you need us to understand so that we can be what you want us to be. In Jesus' name we do pray. Everybody in God's house shouts. Amen. I'm reading in your hearing from the New Living Translation, the New Living Translation of the word of the, of the, word of the Lord. Here's what it says. Long ago... The Lord said to Israel, long ago, the Lord said to Israel, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. With unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. Somebody needs to receive these next words. I will rebuild you. <laughs> I will rebuild you my virgin Israel, you will again be happy. Can you receive that in your spirit today? And dance merrily with your tambourines. Verse 5, again you will plant your vineyards on the mountains of Samaria and eat from your own gardens there. Verse 6, the day will come when watchmen will shout, from the hill country of Ephraim, come, let us go up to Jerusalem to worship the Lord our God. I want to preach for a few minutes from the title, Unfailing Love, Unfailing Love, as we continue this series, hashtag love. You may have your seats in the presence of the Lord. I'm recently... Just literally last night, arriving back from Los Angeles, California, um, where I uh, went to attend the official uh, premiere of my brother's new movie called Breakthrough. Um, suffice it to say that it was an incredible experience, and uh, not just because uh, he's my brother. I want to encourage you to find your way to the theater to see this incredible true story that is, there is none other like it on medical record where a son or a boy or a man or a woman survives being under ice cold freezing water for 15 plus minutes and then unresponsive for over 45 minutes. There's no other person that has survived that except John Smith and his story is told on big screen and it is told from a mother's perspective that prayed and he came back to life. In fact, the doctors say, the doctor report says, boy died, mother prayed, son returns to life. Um, and so I want to encourage you to see it if you haven't. But I was there to, 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 to share in this very special moment for our family. Uh, however, I arrived on Thursday morning to a city that was broken and in the middle of funeralizing a man by the name of Aramaeus Joseph Askamon, better known as Nipsey Hussle. The sense of loss in the city was palpable. From the corporate offices downtown all the way to Crenshaw Boulevard, his death, there was a noticeable impact in the city as a result of his death. Thousands flooded the Staples Center. You can take the picture down. I'm not ready for it yet. Thousands flooded the Staples Center to pay their respects. Not notables like Minister Louis Farrakhan, uh, uh, Snoop Dogg, Anthony Hamilton, YG, and many others gave uh, genuine reflections expressing the deep loss they felt as a result of this sen senseless murder. Even President Barack Obama sent a letter of condolence. 
Many have expressed that they were not even aware of Nipsey Hussle and his work until after his death. However, they have still felt impacted by this loss, and the question I have for you today is why? Why have so many felt a kinship with a man they did not know? Why have so many felt loss even from a distance? And I believe the answer to these questions are rooted in one word, and that word is investment. Nipsey, Nipsey Hussle's work extended beyond creative lyrics to express his experiences in his life. His, his, his work was beyond creating music that highlighted his appreciation for the unseen aspects of his neighborhood or his community. His work was more than a celebration of both trials and triumphs of what was happening in his hood. His work included investment in his community. Nipsey expressed love through his words and through his deeds. I need you to stick with me today. He did so by seeking to create an environment where the community that was once a place for his demise would now become a place where others could fulfill their destiny. I want you to get an insight into the kind of investment that he made into his community. Now you can put the graphic on the screen. Here is a collection of the investments that, that he made. He, he launched a, a, a initiative called Our Opportunity, which is a coalition dedicated to developing properties and revamping neighborhoods across multiple cities. He co-funded a STEM academy. I'm jumping through just a few of these. He co-funded a STEM academy with plans to expand across three cities. His, he had an active role in establishing something called Destination Crenshaw, which was a 1.3 mile public art space honoring LA's black heritage, which was set to open in 2020. He reopened World on Wheels, a roller rink initiated, initially, excuse me, damaged during the 1992 LA riots. He established Steve's Barbershop in honor of his friend and business part partner who died from gun violence. He was set to have a partnership that would have been activated with Puma upcoming this, uh, this fall with, between Puma and his, his clothing brand, The Marathon. I want you to understand something. Not only that, but he, he, he was a leader in an organization called Vector90, which was a business incubator and accelerator that helped young entrepreneurs get off the ground. His impact is totaled in this graph. As a result of his efforts, he either hired, assisted, or impacted 41,369 people to the tune of an investment of $210,413,500. This was one individual's expression of love. Come on, somebody. I need you to catch this with me in the house today. That, that, that it was not, his love went beyond mere appreciation to real investment. And I need you to get this today because if you're going to understand the ethos and the thesis of this message, you need to understand that appreciation is not the same as love. I need you to get this with me. The, the evidence of real love is, is simply this. Real love can be summed up in one word, investment. You can take the picture now because, because here it is. I need you to get this. See, if I like you, that means I appreciate your attributes. But if I love you, that means I want to preserve and support your attributes. I need you to get this in the house with me. There's a, very, there's a big difference between liking and loving. And I want you to understand that if you like someone, that means you appreciate them. But if you love someone, that means you're willing to invest in them. Here's, here, here, here it is. Here it is. When you love someone, you say you, you want to create an environment where that person can flourish. 
You want, to, you want that person to experience peace, joy, and prosperity. When you love someone, I wish I had somebody who understands love, amen. When you love someone, you want to use all that you are to help that person build and, and grow, to become their fullest potential. When you, when you love someone, you want to put in work so that person can thrive emotionally, mentally, professionally, physically, and most importantly, spiritually. Liking someone is an act of appreciation. Loving someone is an act of investment. Often the reason why marriages fail is because we walk down the aisle on a like. But, but, but a successful marriage requires a love that invests. Watch this. When you say, I'm falling in love with you, it shouldn't be because you make my heart skip. When I see you, it makes me happy. I can't wait to talk to you when we are away. I miss you when you're gone. All of these statements are, are statements of appreciation. Mm. I, I need to drill down so you don't miss this. I need, to, I need to drill down so you don't miss this. I need you to understand something today, that, that, that when you have those butterflies in your stomach, I need you to understand that you should not immediately equate that with love. Love goes beyond statements of appreciation to statements of investments. Have you noticed that the traditional marriage vow says nothing about appreciation but focuses on investment? Oh, I'm trying to make a case today. I wonder if you can walk with me. Listen to what it says. It says, I take you to be my, my wedded husband or wife, to have and to hold from this day forward for better or for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part according to God's divine ordinance. Nothing in there says, I vow to keep missing you when you're gone. Or to always feel happy when you walk into the room. Or to always enjoy everything you do for always and evermore. Nothing in there says that. The vow says, I'm committed to be here for, for the fight. I'm, I'm committed to be here to fight for, for, for our best even when we're at our worst. The vow says, I'm committed to make an investment for your happiness, for your peace, for your joy, for your prosperity, for your health, and for your wealth. It's a vow of investment. My love will be expressed not in what I gain, but in what I give. I wonder if I have any company in the building. Like transforms into love when appreciation becomes investment. And I need you to get this because some of us, and this, is, this ain't a sermon about, about dating, but, but this, this will help somebody in the building today. Amen. Some of us are making forever commitments that are not based upon a foundation of love at all. They are based off of feelings that eventually will be fleeting and you will find yourself failing and I want to help you out, even though I'm not preaching about marriage today, amen. I want to help you out that, that, that your, your, your choice to move forward into forever ought to be based off a willingness to say, I am not just liking you, but I actually want to be part of creating an environment where you can become all that God has for you. That's, when it, that's where the shift happens. The shift is, I, not, I just don't like hanging out with you. I actually want to be part of being, uh, uh, of being what, what God will use to develop and grow you into the person that he wants you to be. Love is not about, is not about uh, appreciation. Love is about investment. Do I have any company in the building? Is this the first time you're hearing it? Say amen. Uh, don't, uh, half of y'all don't want to admit it. I get it. Because everything in our society, I need you to get this before I move on, so I'm pushing just a little bit. Everything in our society focuses around feelings when it comes to love. It focuses around, around how a person makes me feel 
rather than, rather than understanding that real love is not based off of just how I feel, but real love moves beyond feeling to make a decision that I want to help create an environment, I want to create, help to create a space where that person that I say I love can become all that God desires for them to be. And I would suggest, I'm going to move on, this is the last part, part about relationships, but I would suggest that if you have not made up in your mind that you're ready to make that commitment, you shouldn't get married. Amen, the two of you that got it, amen. But if you can understand that, then maybe you can begin to understand the way God deals with us when it comes to his unfailing love. Unfailing love, unfailing love is more than God saying he won't give up. Unfailing love suggests no experience in your life, watch this, is an indication that God has failed to make good on his investment. No experience is an indication his, has been, his investment in you has been withdrawn. No experience is an indication that he no longer is committed to, make, uh, to his vow to make beauty out of your life because his love does not fail. For it, it, for, for it to fail, it would have to cease to make an investment in your future. And this is where the devil tries to trip us up. When we are going through challenging moments, he wants to convince us that the, that the Lord has given up on his investment in who he has promised for us to be. I want you to get this in your spirit today, that the devil wants you to believe that when you are in a valley, when you're in a place of frustration, when the foundation is shifting, the devil wants you to believe that God has given up on his decision to make an investment in your life for the future and for your destiny. And I want you to get this today, that God has not, I don't care what you may be going through, God has not given up on his plan to invest in you so that you can become what he's called you to become. No experience in your life is an indication that God is given up on his decision to invest in who he has designed you to be. I need you to get that. I need you to get that today. No experience, nothing that you go through, hallelujah, and I'm going to show you in deeper detail. I'm going to show you in deeper detail in a second, but nothing you go through is, 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 should, ought to be a suggestion that God has failed at his, his work of loving you the way that you need to be loved. Notice I said need, not want. Amen. So, so, so I think it's helpful to understand, watch this, what God's goal is with his investment, right? He, he, what, what is God's goal, right? And it's in, it's in the text that we started with today. If you're with me, come on and say amen. If you're with me, say amen. Here it is, right here in the text. He says, he says, long ago I have loved you. I'm back at, I'm back at uh, verse 3 in, in chapter 31. Long ago he said, I have loved you, my people with an everlasting love, with an unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. I will rebuild you. Come on, somebody. If you're going to be rebuilt, that first means that you had to go through a season of devastation. Watch this. He says, again, you will be happy. That suggests at one time you weren't happy. I mean, you were happy, and then you went through a season where you weren't happy, but he's made a promise right here. Again, you will be happy. And you're going to be so happy that you're going to dance merrily with a tambourine. Amen. That makes, some, that makes some traditional church folks real happy. Amen. I got any tambourine players still in the building? Anybody know how to play that tambourine? Amen. Praise the Lord. Verse 5 says, again, you will plant your vineyards on the mountains of Samaria and eat from your own gardens there. And I'm going to tell you what that means in a second. And then verse 6, the day will come when watchmen will shout from the hill country of Ephraim, come, let us go up to Jerusalem to worship the Lord our God. I need you to get this in your spirit today. There's three things that he's saying right in this passage right here that he is going to do. The first thing is he's going to create joy and happiness. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on and say amen. The second thing is he'll, he'll create purpose and provision. And the third thing is he's going to build community around you. Amen. Amen. Joy 
and happiness. That's right. That's right. I said joy and happiness. Joy and happiness. Amen. Joy is, is a state of being. Amen. Happiness, happiness is a feeling that is based off of what is happening. Amen. You can have joy no matter what is happening. Amen. You can. I know that's like, well, are you serious? Yes, you can have joy no matter what is happening. There's, there's a choice to be made. Sometimes it's hard to make it. Come on, can we be honest? Can we just be Do I have an honest church? Sometimes it's hard to choose joy. When you're in the middle of hell. Come on and say amen. It's hard to choose joy. Amen. But I want you to understand, joy is a state of being. Happiness is based off of what is happening. And what God is saying in that verse, again, not only are you going to ha be happy, he says, but you're going to dance merrily. What he's trying to say is you're going to be able to have joy and experience a season where what is happening around you actually brings happiness to your heart. Amen. Then he goes on to say, you're going to plant in your vineyards. You know, we all have to have purpose. I believe purpose is connected to what, 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 what God has actually called us to do. So he says, uh, you're going to plant in your vineyards, and I'm going to allow you to have a garden that you can eat from. So that is purpose and provision. And then he says, there are going to be people who just want to come and hang out with you. That's what they're saying. He says, they're going to shout, and they're going to say, the, the, the boys from Ephraim are going to want to come hang out in Jerusalem. I need you to catch the text. Amen. And so what he's saying is, I'm actually going to create an environment, watch this, where there are other like-minded people around you that you can rejoice with. No, I didn't get enough amens in the building. He's going, look, I don't know about you, but sometimes I just want somebody who's on the same page as I am. Come on, somebody. I just want somebody who's trying to get where I'm trying to get. I just want somebody who's rocking the way I'm rocking. I just want somebody who can rejoice with me and not, it's all, and it's not always jealous. Look, I'm going to celebrate your win. Can you celebrate my win too? Right? So, so, so here it is. He says he's going to do these things, but here's the catch. Watch this. The question is, how is he going to do it? Because I believe God doesn't just want to do something for you, but he wants to do something in you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, this is, this is the hard part. Come on, hold on. If you're still with me, say, I'm with you, Pastor. Here it is. He says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to establish a new covenant. It's in verse 31 through 33. I'm going to read it in your hearing. It might end up on the screen. Here's what it says. It says, the day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. The, this covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them uh, by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant. Though I loved them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. Now, can I just stop right there for a second and rejoice that God is willing to provide a new covenant after the first one was broken? Oh, y'all ain't in the house today. I need somebody to just bless the Lord that that is evidence of a God who keeps investing even when we have failed. Amen. He said, they broke it, but I'm going, to, I'm going to create a new one. And this is what he says, but this is the new covenant. I will make the people, make uh, with the people of Israel that after those days. Here's the covenant. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. In other words, what he's saying is he's going to place a spiritual GPS inside of, God, of his children. Amen? He's going, to, he's going to actually, so it's not something that you have to read, but it is something that lives within you. Amen? That's the transition of the covenant. It wasn't going to be written on tablets of stone, but it was going to be written on their hearts. Amen? And ours too. 
Amen. So that's the transition. That is the new covenant. We broke the first one, but in God's unfailing love, he then develops a new one, and he says this one's going to be greater because it's not going to be external. It's going to be internal. But now, but now, how can a God who prioritizes choice get his will to live on the inside of us? Are, 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 are you catch, capturing that? Because God is never going to force himself on you. So, 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 Siobhan, I'm trying to figure out how does God, who says, I'm never going to push myself on you, I'm never going to force myself on you, how does he actually allow his will to end up uh, uh, on, 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 on the lining of our hearts? How does he do it? Well, here's the challenging part. Say, this is a hard part. Come on, say, this is the hard part. The way God goes about establishing his new covenant in our hearts is expressing love in a dichotomy of ways. And here's what I mean. God's love is expressed in wrath and redemption. God's love is, expect, is expressed in devastation and restoration. God's love is expressed in poverty and in prosperity. Amen. What do you mean, Pastor? What are you saying? You just said he's going to bring joy and happiness. You just said I'm going to have purpose and provision. You just said, Pastor, that, that I would have community, folks who will ride and die with me. What do you mean that I have to potentially experience devastation before I can experience restoration? I'm coming right from the text. Can I just read a few to you real quick? Verse 10 says this, the Lord, watch this, the Lord who scattered his people. Who did it? The Lord scattered his people. The same God that scattered his people will gather them and watch over them as a shepherd does the flock. Verse 20, he says, is not Israel still my son, my darling child? Watch this, this is funny. I often have to punish him but I still love him. That's why I long for him and surely will have mercy on him. Come on, somebody. In chapter 32, verses 37 and 38, it says, I will certainly bring back my people again from all the countries where I will scatter them in my fury. I will bring them back to this very city and let them live in a place of peace and safety. They will be my people and I will be their God. Verse 40 says this, this is what the Lord says, just as I have brought all these calamities on them. Who brought the calamities? Just as I have brought all these calamities on them, so I will do all the good that I have promised. Can I ask you a question? Are you willing to celebrate God when you feel favor on your life? And are you also willing to celebrate God when you feel like there is failure on your life? Because God is working in both of them. I wish I had a witness in the building. He, he says, he says, I have to sometimes push you out so that I can bring you back in. I have to sometimes let you go so that I can recover you with my love. I have to sometimes let you experience stress so that you will understand that it was really meant for your striving. I have to sometimes let you go through so that you can come out better than you went in. Watch this. Watch this. Because when you go through the fire, come on somebody, you start perfecting your character and your character becomes more like his. I wish I had a witness in the building. Uh, uh, when you go through a challenge, it actually refines you so that you can walk through future challenges with more grace and more joy and more understanding and more purpose. When you go through, you become more like God. Because I don't know anybody else besides Jesus that had to endure 
what he had, I don't know anybody else, but, but, but here, here's where his mission was perfected. Hear me, his mission was not perfected in the moments of healing. His mission was not perfected in the moments where he resurrected the dead. His mission was perfected when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Do I have any company in the building? Pastor, somebody said, I don't even know what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, let me tell you real quick. Amen. Here it is, right before he's about to go to the cross. And we are at the weekend before, before uh, we celebrate his death, resurrection, uh, his death, burial, and resurrection. And so uh, 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 a few days before he was about to go through the cross, he was feeling the heaviness of the sin that he would have to bear. And he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes to his, his prayer closet. Come on and say amen. And he begins to talk to his father. And he's like, Father, could you let this cup pass? It's heavy on me. It's weighing on me. It's difficult to manage what I'm in. I don't see you. I don't feel you the way that I used to. God, what is going on in this moment? It seems like I can't even get any friends to hang out with me. The three dudes I asked to watch and pray, they over there sleeping. God, why am I in this by myself? Why am I going through this alone? Why do I have to bear these burdens? Why do I have to struggle like this? Why do I have to stress like this? Why do I have to worry like this? Why is it so heavy right now, God? But here's what he says. Not my will, but yours be done. See, this is the shift. This is the shift. This is when Jesus perfected his mission. He perfected his mission when he wanted to give up, but he made a choice to stay in. I need somebody to get with me in the building today. I need somebody to just understand that the Lord ain't forsaking you. Even though you're in a dark place, the Lord has not given up on you. Even though you're in a weary place, the Lord has not given up on you. Even though you are in a stressful place, I want you to understand this is the place where you your mission is perfected. This is the place where his character is written on your heart. This is the place where you become what he has already destined you to become. This is the place where you come out as pure gold. You can't come out as pure gold unless you're willing to walk through the, through the fire. So I need some fire walkers in the building today that will get some boldness in your heart today and say it's burning me right now, but I will not turn back. I will walk through the fire. I will walk through the valley of the shadow. I will walk. Devil, you thought you could stop me. Devil, you thought I had given up. Devil, you thought I was going to turn back. Devil, you thought the game was over. But I just realized God had to take me through this because this is part of his investment. Oh, this is how he has determined he will invest in my life. He's going to invest while I'm in the fire. He's going to invest while I'm in the flood. He's going to invest while I'm in the, the difficult place. I need somebody in the building to say, Lord, I receive your investment because I understand today that your investment is really an expression of your love and so sometimes before I see the fruit of your investment I gotta go through a period of growth I gotta go through a period of pain I gotta go through a period of struggle I gotta go through a period of strife I gotta go through a period of hurt I gotta lose some people along the way but I'm coming out I'm coming out as pure gold. Oh, Lord. I'm not going to stay in this place. God has better for me. He will restore my joy. He will rebuild me again. He will allow me to dance. He will turn my weeping into dancing. I wish I had somebody in the building who could just bless the Lord that you have made a decision Today, you will be a firewalker. Who is 
is it? Who's making your decision today? Who's making your decision today? The fire's not gonna destroy you. It's gonna grow you. The fire is not gonna diminish you. It's gonna build you. The fire is not gonna take you out. The fire is gonna help you to step in to who he's called you to be. Will you bless the Lord in the pit? His unfailing love, it will never lose its power. Come on and bless him, miracle good in the building. Put your hands together. Hallelujah. Come on. Mountain. And it flows. To the lowest. Oh, it's the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never. For it reaches, for it reaches, for it reaches to the highest mountain. Hey, mountain. mountain. And Rest in your heart. Fine reaches. I want to pray for you. Everybody standing to your feet. With every head bowed, every eyes closed. If you need to make a decision for Jesus Christ today, you need to surrender your heart to him. You need to give your life into his hands. Today, I want to invite you to make a decision. Will you make a decision today that you're going to trust the investment God has made and is making in your life? 
It may not always look like you want it, but I am confident it is what you need. So man, woman, boy or girl, where every head is bowed, every eye is closed, this is a decision between you and the Lord. I'm not inviting you down today. I just want you to raise your hand. If you, need you, if you know you need to give your life to the Lord, if you know you need to come back to him, you were once with him, but you need to come back, you need to rededicate your life to him. You want to be baptized or you want to join this church? On the count of three, I want you to raise your hand and saying, I'm making a decision today. One, two, three. Stretch your hand in the air. Say, I'm making a decision for Jesus today. I'm making a decision for Jesus. I see the hands. I see those hands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are there others? Are there others in the building today? You're making a decision today. Hallelujah. We see those hands. Praise the Lord. It's time for you to say, God, I understand that my life belongs to you. Will you repeat this prayer? Say, dear Jesus, I'm nothing without you. I understand that you died for my sins and that you rose from the grave. And the power that rose you from the grave is available to transform my life. And today, I receive you into my heart and I make a commitment that you can have control of my life. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching. I pray that you were blessed by this message. We'd love to connect with you beyond this moment. So I wanna invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, you'll get updates on when a new sermon is posted as well as when we go live during our worship experiences uh, on Saturdays at 12 p.m. Uh, also, you can connect with us on social media. You can go to Facebook or Instagram and look for Miracle City Church. And on Twitter, you can find us at Miracle City Life. We really do believe that God's doing something special in this congregation and in this family. And we're so blessed that you've chosen um, to connect with us. And if you've been blessed and you want to be a blessing, we invite you to go to our website. You can find all the information for giving there by going to miraclecitychurch.org slash give. And we know the Lord will bless you for your generosity. Thank Thanks so much for being part of what God is doing here and we pray many blessings on your life.